Got another video for the A-level chemistry multiple choice practice. So this is the second one for AS chemistry. I've also got separate playlists for inorganic and physical chemistry and organic chemistry. Hope you like the video and if you haven't already subscribed, why don't you consider subscribing to the channel? But as always, the link to the questions in the description of the video if you want to try them first. Okay, so we'll make a start. So we can see I've already answered number one. So it's A, gallium three plus ions have got 28 electrons, whereas the other three have got 18 each. Number two, just a standard empirical formula calculation. So we put the percentages in, divide by the MR, that gives us the moles, divide by the smallest gives us the ratio, and that's coming out at two to five to one, so the answer was D. Moving on to number three, so at the heart of this calculation is every mole of carbon in the hydrocarbon is gonna generate the same number of moles of carbon dioxide. So all we've got to do is work out how many moles of carbon we've got, and that's going to tell us how many moles of carbon dioxide. So before I reveal the answers for B, C, and D, I'll just explain where this 0.8's come from, and then I'll just show the rest. So if you've got 0.4 moles of C2H6, you're going to have 0.8 moles of carbon, 0.4 times 2. So that means you're going to get 0.8 moles of CO2. So there's the rest, the highest moles of CO2, 0.9, so that's the greatest volume. So B was the answer. Number four, quick way to do this is just look at your waste products and the one with the highest MR of waste will be the lowest atom economy. So C's got the heaviest waste products, so that will have the lowest atom economy. So C is the answer. Number five, just a quick reminder of the formula we use to calculate percentage uncertainty. So that's the plus or minus value in the reading, so 0.05 in this case, divided by what's been measured, so that's going to be the tighter, times 100. So the catch in this question is the fact that we have to double the plus or minus value because a titra, this 19.95 cm cubed, has come from two burette readings. So that error, that uncertainty, is in both of those readings. So we have to double that, and the answer comes out at 0.5%, so D is the answer. Moving on to number six, so all we're interested in is the, um, the subshell, the outer subshell that's filling in these atoms, because obviously anything before that will be filled, so they won't be singly occupied. So there's those outer subshell configurations. You probably don't need the boxes, but I'll just quickly explain that the P2 will look like that. The P5 fills like that. S2 like that. P1 like that. So obviously A is the answer with two singly occupied orbitals. Number seven, so two quick questions to ask to determine whether it's polar or not. Have we got different terminal atoms? Are the atoms around the um, central atom different? Well, no, they're not, they're all chlorines. Have we got any lone pairs around the central atom? If the answer is yes, it's gonna be polar. So A is the answer because obviously oxygen's in group six, it's only making two bonds, so there are four electrons left over, two lone pairs. Whereas all the others, so boron group three, making three bonds, carbon group four, making four bonds, sulfur group six, making six bonds, no lone pairs in any of those. Number eight is all down to the type of structure. So silicon's got a giant covalent structure. All the others are simple covalent structures. So what have you got to break to melt a giant covalent structure? Covalent bonds between the atoms, which takes a lot of energy. So silicon has the highest melting point. We're just breaking relatively weak London forces between molecules in the other three. Number nine, so D was the correct statement. The induced dipole-dipole interactions are London forces are increasing as you go down the group because you've got more electrons in the molecule. Number 10, which silver compound is insoluble in concentrated aqueous ammonia? And of course, it's D, silver iodide. I'll just use these two diagrams to explain this one. So in the first experiment, you'll notice I've got 0.05 moles in the beaker and that's because that's how many moles of alkali and acid they've used, and that's how much water they've made. And we know the temperature rise for that 
is 6 degrees C and the total volume in that beaker is going to be 100 cm cubed from the two 50 cm cubed of acid and alkali. And then in experiment two, you'll notice they're only using half the moles of chemicals, so they're making half the moles of water. So half the energy is going to be released in experiment two, but the crucial thing here is it's only having to heat up half the volume of liquid. So the temperature rise in experiment two will be exactly the same as experiment one. So it's going to be six degrees again. So option C. Number 12, we've got a table full of enthalpy changes of combustion. I'm going to use them to calculate the enthalpy change for the reaction. So there's my little reminder. C for combustion, R minus P reactants minus products. So there's the formula in full. It's the sum of the enthalpy changes of combustion of all your reactants minus the sum of the enthalpy changes of combustion of all your products. So we'll just put the numbers in. So there's all the numbers in there. And when you put that in your calculator, you should have got option B minus 126.5. Question 13. So we'll look at pressure first. Will pressure affect this equilibrium position? No, because you've got two moles of gas on the left, two moles of gas on the right. So anything with pressure in, we can cross out. So to get the effect of temperature, we've got to establish what kind of reaction the forward reaction is. So the delta H is negative, which means the forward reaction is exothermic. And so we need a low temperature to favor that forwards exothermic reaction. So we decrease the temperature, so option B. Question 14, you can see I've already numbered the carbon chain. So it's a but, it's a chain of four. So we can get rid of options C and D, certainly not ethenes. So the next thing we've got to do is establish whether we've got the E form or the Z form of 2-bromobutuene. So how do we do that? We establish priority groups on each carbon of the double bond. So we're looking at atomic numbers. So if we look at carbon 2, we've got bromine versus carbon, both directly attached to carbon 2. Bromine's got a higher atomic number. So that's got priority on that carbon. Do the same for carbon three. So we've got an invisible hydrogen, atomic number one versus carbon with an atomic number of six. Obviously carbon wins that one. So the priority groups are on opposite sides of the double bond. That's the E form. So that's option A. And the E, if you're interested, comes from German word for opposite, entgegen. Number 15, so just put dots where the hydrogens are. Don't forget about the OH hydrogen. You wouldn't believe how many people forget the, the most obvious one. So it is 12 hydrogens, so it was option C. Number 16, you can see I've circled C5H12. It's following the general formula CNH2N plus 2. So this is saturated. So what are our options? Well, we could have a continuous chain of five. So we could have that. We could shorten the carbon chain by one and put a branch, a methyl branch on. So it doesn't matter which carbon it goes on because that's the same as that. Um, we could shorten the carbon chain again to three, and but we would need to put the methyl groups like that. So that's the third one and that's it. Now, just in case you were wondering if this one was a possibility, so a chain of three and then, then an ethyl group, that is actually the same as this one because the continuous carbon chain is this one. Now, one, two, three, four long. One, two, three, four. Methyl on two, methyl on two. So they are the same. Number 17, you'll notice I've written down all C8H18. They're all got the same molecular formula. So this has got nothing to do with the number of electrons influencing the London forces. It's down to branching. So the one with the most branching will have the lowest boiling point, and that is A234 trimethylpentin. Number 18, so I'll just start with a reminder that when you react an alcohol with an acid catalyst, it's going to form an alkene, and that's because it removes the an H2O molecule effectively from the alcohol. I always get my students to think of the H2O as HOH, so in two parts. I'll explain the significance of that in a second. And basically, we're looking for the alkene that could produce EZ 
house on resin. First thing I'm going to do is rule out B and D. So the two one alls, they're going to produce one enes. So that means the carbon carbon double bond is going to be on the end carbon or the first carbon. So that very, very end carbon is going to have two hydrogens on it. And so because of that, you can't show EZ isomerism. So starting with A, there's pentan 3 all. So we're going to remove the H2O in those two parts. So take the OH off first. The single H we have to take from an adjacent carbon atom. So it doesn't matter whether we take it from here or here. We're going to make the same alkene. So just draw that up. So we're going to get that one there. So that's pent 2 -ene. So can this show EZ stereoisomerism? Well, yes it can, because each carbon of the double bond has got different groups or atoms attached to it. So this carbon here has got an ethyl group and a hydrogen, so they're different. This carbon here has got a methyl group and a hydrogen, so they're different. So A is actually the answer. I'll quickly explain C. So there's the alcohol, 2 methyl butan 2 all. So again, we take the OH off and we can take the H off an adjacent carbon. So there's adjacent carbons there. They're equivalent to each other. So it doesn't matter which one we go for there. That, 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 that would give the same alkene. Or we could go there. So there's actually two alkene products here. So if we look at this top one, you can see we've got a carbon-carbon double bond at the end of the chain. So it's a it's a one ene. So this definitely can't show EZ stereoisomerism because we've got two H's here. And this one here, you've got two identical methyl groups on this carbon. So that rules that one out as well. Number 19, I've highlighted the word reflux because that's important in the question. So when you heat an alcohol, with a mixture of sulfuric acid and potassium dichromate 6. That's an oxidizing agent, so you're oxidizing the alcohol. So this question is testing our knowledge and understanding of the oxidation of alcohols under reflux. So there's just a reminder of what's possible. So a primary alcohol will be oxidized under reflux to a carboxylic acid. A secondary is going to be oxidized to a ketone. And a tertiary alcohol can't be oxidized, so you'll still have an alcohol at the end. So the best thing to do now is identify the types of alcohols we've got. So A, that's a tertiary alcohol, because we've got three carbon groups bonded to the OH carbon. B is a secondary alcohol. C and D are both primary. Okay, so if we go back to the infrared spectrum, so you can see that we've got no activity in this region here. So there's no OH group in this product. And because of that, that means we can't have a carboxylic acid. We can't have an alcohol. So it's got to be a ketone and it is because we've got the C double bond O there. So the answer must be B, secondary alcohol. And finally, which alcohol is not likely to have a fragment at M over Z 43? So we'll just look and can we break something off and have an, a mass basically of 43? So A was the answer, by the way. I'll just show you why the others can have those fragments. So B, if you break that bit off, that's 43. We've got the same fragment on that side of that alcohol. And for D, CH3 twice CH is also 43. So A, the answer.